We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Him for sending us with Khatim and Nabi'een, Habibullah, the seal of the Prophets, the beloved of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is Uswatun Hasana, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, as He says in Surah Al Ahzab. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكْرُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا He says, indeed, in a messenger of Allah, you have an excellent pattern, Uswatun Hasana, an excellent example to follow for whoever hopes to meet Allah the last day and remembers Him much. And the example, the specific example we want to talk about today is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us by command of Allah to act in community with each other, not as individuals or isolationists or doing our own thing. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commanded in the Quran and Surah so Ali Imran, Allah says, Wa atasimu bi habdillahi jami'an. Hold to the rope of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala all together. The rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it has been explained by the Sahaba and many of the Mufassirin, those who comment and give commentary and explain the Qur'an, the rope of Allah is Al-Qur'an. So I'm saying Al-Islam. So hold on to Islam jami'an, in community, together. Wala tafaruku, and do not be divided. And do not be divided. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another hadith that was narrated by Al-Hadith Al-Ash'ari in uh, Bukhari's book, not his Sahih, but his other book in his Tariq, he says he was commanded with, he's commanded us with five things that he has been commanded with. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that he commands us, he orders us five things. And he's saying five things that he's ordering us to, he uh, he was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first thing that he said was Ali Jama'ah, the community, was Sam'ah, number two, hearing, wa ta'a, three, and obeying, well, Hijrah, 
and migrating for the sake of Allah. And five, or jihad fi sabidillah. Those are the five things that he commanded upon us. And we're going to focus on the first one in these brief few minutes that we have. But first I want to digress and talk about somebody that is extremely important in Al-Islam, Umar bin Al-Khattab. <coughs> Do you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيٌ نَبِيٌ بَعْدِ لَوْ كَانَ Umar bin Al-Khattab. And this is, uh, is recorded by Ibn Tarmidhi in his Sunnah. He said, if there were to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar. But there's no prophet after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's Khatim and Nabiin. He's the seal of the prophet. The prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said that all of the umum had what's called muhaddithin, like the same root word hadith, muhaddithin. And he said the muhaddith of my ummah is Umar bin al-Khattab. A muhaddith in this context. It's not somebody who memorized hadith. A muhaddith in this context is somebody that has what's called ilham, like divine inspiration. Like an angel puts an idea in your head. You have good ideas. These ideas are consistent with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like your opinion is always right. Not necessarily with people, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's called ilham. And this has been uh, exemplified many times during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The scholars have recorded at least 23 occasions in the Quran where Umar ibn al-Khattab expressed an opinion and then Allah revealed a verse in the Quran almost word for word for what Umar said. And so to Bakr, uh, uh, on a particular occasion, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, we should take uh, the maqam of Ibrahim by the Kaaba as a place of prayer. Then Allah will read the same thing in the Quran. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam separated from his wives, and then Umar bin al-Khattab got an audience with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ascertained what the problem was. And part of the thing, one of the things that Umar bin al-Khattab said was that perhaps Allah will replace them with better wives. Then Allah revealed the same thing in the Quran. After the Battle of Badr, when they had prisoners of war, this is the first time the Muslims were fighting. They didn't know what to do. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took shorter. He took consultation. He said, what should we do with these prisoners? Abu Bakr said, we should hold them for ransom. We can use the money to do some good with. And then release them back. It was more than, as many companions that gave their opinions. Umar ibn al-Khattab was like, no, no, no. We should soak the earth, warm the earth with their blood. And he said, and no, we should, we should just not just kill them. What we should do is have, get, give Akil to Ali. They were brothers. Akil and Ali were brothers. They're both sons of Abu Talib. He said, give Akil to Ali and let Ali kill him. And he went down the list like that. And the reason why he said that was because that was the nature of their uh, persecution in Mecca. They left it to the individual family members to tor torture and persecute the Muslims and their family. So he said, we should do it like this to let them know that we're more serious about our Iman, our faith, than they, than they, than they are about their kufr. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said many things. Uh, one of the things he said was, he said, Ibrahim, you have a character, I mean, he said, Abu Bakr, you have a character like like Ibrahim and Asa, he said, Umar, you harsh. You have a character like uh, Nuh and Musa. They, you know, they made uh, supplication against their people. And so he took Abu Bakr's advice and he uh, took ransom for, with the, for the prisoners of war. Later on, Umar ibn al-Khattab came back and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala and many of the other Sahaba crying, weeping, hard, boo-hooing. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, what makes you cry? Please tell me so I can cry with you. And he said, 
If it wasn't for the mercy of Allah, Ya Umar, all of us would be destroyed except for you. And he related for him the verse that was revealed when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is not proper for a prophet to seek prisoners of war until he intensifies killing in the land. The reason why we mention this, this, this whole story is because of the opinion of Umar ibn al Khattab. He was muhaddath. So his words is weighty. His word is heavy. His words mean something. His words is not like any sheikh living nowadays or any scholar from the past. His word is heavy. After Abu Bakr Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala and who, his word means something. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-kulafa rashidin mahdim in ba'di. It is obligatory upon you to follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs that come after me. And we know those rightly guided caliphs are Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Again, the focus, Umar. Why are we focusing on Umar? Why are we focusing on community? Because Umar ibn al-Khattab, he made a statement that captures what we're talking about. He said, and this uh, narration is narrated on the authority of a Tamim al-Dharri, and you can find it in uh, uh, Sunnah of a Dharmi, uh, Hadith Collection of Dharmi. He said, إِنَّهُ لَا إِسْلَامَ إِلَّا بِجَمَعَةٍ He said that verily there is no Islam without community. Verily there is no Islam without community. And he said, and there's no community without leadership. And there's no leadership without obedience. The little Umar bin al-Khattab said. He captured it right there. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa aftalu salatu wa tamu taslim, ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, wa radiyallahu ta'ala ala sadi tatabiyin, wa ulema al-amaleen, wa ahimatu al-arabat al-mujtahidin, wa maqalidihim ila yawmideen amma ba'ad. The type of speech he uses even in fact, in black and white. Because he used a type of construction, it's called Lad and Gensi. It's called the, the type of lad that negates everything. When you read the English grammar books, they say this is complete denial of the class. It's the same type of lad that's used in the Shahad. La ilaha. There is no God. Illallah. Except the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we were to chop that statement in half and leave out the stigma, leave out the, leave out the exception. They accept the law, the atheists will love it. They, if they, the shadow was that, that half, the atheists will love it. They will love this love. There is no God. Because it means that. It means that it, God does not exist at all. There's no possibility for there to be a God. If you just leave it at that statement. Illallah. Accept the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the ayat, after ayat to Kursi. Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, Ayat 255. The very next verse, 256, begins, La ikraha fiddin. There is no compulsion in a religion. See, if you notice this type of uh, construction, if you enter Arabic, it's very basic. It's not high level Arabic. You have the la followed by a noun. And that noun is nesab, it's mansub, it ends in fatta. That's the indication that is this the type of la you're dealing with? That that thing, doesn't exist. La ilaha. You know, we don't say la ilahu or la ilahi. We say la ilaha. La ikraha. There is no compulsion. Fifteen. What does this mean? This means that you can't put a gun to somebody's head and make them become Muslim. This is why the people who attack Islam don't know what they're talking about. Because right there in the Quran, every Muslim on even a, a basic bare elementary level knows that you can't put a sword to something Islam was spread by the sword. Every Muslim knows that a forced conversion to Islam ain't acceptable. La ikraha fitin. 
this same construction. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La ta'ata lil maluk makhluk fi masiyat al That there is no obedience to the creation while you're disobeying the creator. Same construction. It's the only reason we mention it, to show you how emphatic this language is. Umar, if you know, if you paid attention, he said the same thing. La islamah. Illa bi jama'atin. There is no Islam without community. What does this mean? It means that the Islam that we're practicing is not, is, is deficient, is incomplete without community. Which is why we're in a sad situation right now, because most of us are think as individuals. We don't think about what's good for the whole. We think about what's good for the self, and that hurts the whole, including yourself. Because we're short-sighted. And the whole community suffers. I said it over and over again. It's the same way uh, about a, with a person that has a car. And he doesn't care anything whatsoever about an oil change, fixing brake pads. He don't care. As long as he, he gets in it and it drives. And it takes it where it needs to go. Preventative maintenance doesn't even occur to him. He'll argue with you. I don't care about all that stuff. I'm just worried about me. I'm just driving where I'm, where I'm going. And sad, you sound funny and stupid, but I know people like this. I know people that will buy a car and not put a dime of maintenance in it and drive it until you can't drive it no more and then junk it and then get, get on the bus. I know people like that. This is the way some people do with Islam. They don't put any work into it. They don't put any work at whatsoever into the brotherhood. They don't visit nobody. They don't give sadaqah. They don't visit the sick. They don't help nobody. But when they need help, they blame the Muslims. The Muslims ain't no good. See, that's why I don't come around here no more, man. I needed the brothers and they wasn't there for me. Where, where was you when the other brothers needed you? This deed is like a car. You got to put work into it. And don't blame everybody else when the car stops driving. Stops driving. It's your fault. I remember almost about 14 years ago. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There were some sisters in New York City who came together to build or open up uh, a shelter for women. A group of sisters came together seasoned African-American sisters, been in Dean for a long time, got together with the intention, with the desire to open a, a shelter for sisters who needed uh, housing, for whatever reason. These sisters, everybody knew them, they were well known in the community, all of them been, uh, been in the Dean before I took Shahada, some of them been in the Dean before I was born. And these sisters are struggling to open up a shelter. And I knew many of them. And one particular, they used to have fundraisers every year to raise money for this shelter. And one particular time, I used to be like a regular speaker. So one particular time, they had a big fundraiser. It's supposed to be big. And they had at least about a dozen imams speaking. And we walked into the auditorium where they have it at. Probably a little more than a hundred people there. Like, where is everybody at? It's like it's getting less and less. Sister said, Naeem said, the imams, they're not really supporting us like they should. We let all the imams know what we were doing, and many of them, they set up another lecture conference on the other side of the city. I said, SubhanAllah, I was so upset, I changed my whole lecture that day. And I, can t and I condemned most of the other imams that were right there on the stage with me. They said I was a troublemaker. Why is that a problem? Number one, it's a problem 
that the shelter even exists, that the need exists for a shelter. Why do sisters have to open up their own shelter when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I'll rejoin Kawamuna Ali said? That the men are the protectors and maintainers of the women. If the women have to protect and maintain themselves, that means the men are not doing it. No matter which way you cut it. So the fact that a shelter exists or the idea for the shelter exists is strike one against the men in the leadership. We already messed up. Then number two, you want to back door block it to make sure, try to make it not happen. The sisters end up Having somebody else fundraising, one of the big umbrella organizations. And they took control of it, and then Allah knows best what happened after that. But it ceased to serve the purpose for which it is what was intended. Why I'm saying that? Because the Muslim community is not looking out for each other. We're supposed to look out for each other. At least, at least. In that city, and in this city, the sisters have a situation like that, a shelter. It's okay, it's bad that we got to have a shelter. It's bad that the imams and the men are not doing their job. But there's some cities, most cities, where if a sister needs some help, she has to go to the Christians. She has to go to a YMCA or YWCA run shelter. For example, like in Philadelphia, as big as the Muslim population is. If a Muslim sister needs a place to stay, if she's homeless, she can't go to none of the masters. She got to go to the Christians. And when she get in that Christian shelter, they're going to, they're going to try to indoctrinate her with Christianity. They, they're not going to try to feed her right. They're going to try to force her to take her chemo. Off. Why? The Muslims are not looking out for each other. We're thinking as individuals. We're not thinking as a community. And when we don't think it's a community, we all get hurt. And then we wonder why we don't achieve what we want to achieve. Because when it's my time to want something, I can't get it. Why? Because I didn't help none of you out. And it just goes around like that. The Prophet was not like that. He helped out everyone. Everyone who needed it. The Muslims are like one body. Like one, just it, one body. When one part, part of the body hurts, the other part suffers in fever and pain. This is how the Muslim Ummah works. It's a communal deen. It's not an individual deen. Yes, there's aspects as individual. Because I know we got people that uh, they, they sit and they look for the hole. They forget the, the, the point a little bit. Well, no, they, you do have sunnah prayers. You can't make it a congregation. You got to make it by yourself. Like, you, you know what I'm talking about. And first and foremost, we're supposed to look out for the weaker ones amongst us. The women and children. Because if we don't help ourselves, when other people come to help us, I guarantee you, you're not going to like the help. You're, going, you're not going to like the help. I just came from the, from, from the, uh, the jail today. There are Muslims sitting in jail, no Quran. Why? Who's thinking about them? Or is it just for self? We need to start thinking about all of us. Not just ourselves. All of us. That's what makes this Ummah special. Think about, in my conclusion, the Hadith of Shafa'ah, the Hadith of intercession. You know the Hadith, when uh, the Prophet Sallallahu told us how it's going to be on a day of judgment, when everybody's running the different prophets, asking them for intercession. 
You know the story. They run to, the people run to each prophet. Will you intercede for us? Do you know what every prophet says? They say, nefsi, nefsi. In other words, I'm worried about myself. I'm not worrying about you. I'm not worrying about myself. Then they're going to mention some sin that they did. And when I say, now that's another topic, but it is not a sin, but to their level, it's a sin. Put it that way. The only one who's not going to say nefsi, nefsi, is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he's going to make dua to Allah and Allah's going to allow him to make intercession. Do you know one of the few things he said right before he died? He didn't say nafsi, nafsi, you know that pain? He said, ummati, ummati, my ummah, my ummah. He was worried about all of us. Not just his generation, not just himself. All that pain he was going through, not just his family, he was worried about all of us. Not just all of us that were living during this time, all the, to the very end of our, the Ummah, including us right now. He told his Sahaba that we are his brothers. You right here in this masjid, you Muslim, you the brother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said in the ID. He talked about us. He cared about us, even though he didn't meet us. We have to follow his sunnah in that same way. We have to have a big heart for all of our Muslim brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, he rigged out of me. Ilham Naeem Abdullah of Masjid Al Mu'min and Nurizaman Institute is available for speaking engagements. You can contact Imam Naeem Abdullah at the following via telephone at 267 388 0823 or write him at 537. Paulson Avenue, Pittsburgh, PA 15206 or via email at imamnaim at